So let's get back into the Mesopotamian god and goddesses by talking about the big cheese. Marduk. So, a fun fact about this video before we get started, I literally recorded this entire video about 10 minutes ago, but for some reason, it didn't save in the library. So, I'm gonna try to go through all of this stuff that I already did, again. So, Marduk is the patron god of Babylon. Um, trying to arrange myself here a little bit. Um, yeah, so... In Meso Mesopotamia, he was the patron god of Babylon, which was a big, big city. Uh, it's one of the city-states that eventually rose to power, and when that city rose to power, Marduk basically rose to the top of the pantheon, because a lot of things with deities and religious worships and um, relig religious beliefs and things, they change when the culture or the socioeconomic uh, status or the, you know, um, all sorts of factors with who's in charge in the physical world changes. So, you know, Enlil was basically the big cheese before that, and then Marduk rose to power and then assumed his um, his number 50 through the 50 names. But we'll get into that in a second. So, Marduk, uh, the name liter literally translates to bull calf of the sun. So Marduk's n number, according to the um, Anunnaki numerology stuff, um, basically every god in the... In Every god and goddess in the Mesopotamian pantheon has a number. Marduk happens to be ten, and um, so it's interesting that he is also so associated with the fifty. But once again, I'll get into that in a second. So Marduk is the son of Enki and Damkina. He's the patron god of Babylon. He's associated with the planet that we call Jupiter now, and he's also called the solar calf or the calf of the sun. Um, he is associated with water, vegetation judgment, and magic, and his consort was Sarp, Sarpanit, and um, he was given 50 names, or weapons or powers, after he defeated um, Tiamat during the creation of the universe, according to his tale, the Enuma Elish, that was written um, in Babylon to basically demonstrate his power. Now, you'll find that version of the Enuma Elish pretty much, except for a couple of changes, I think, in the... Magan text of the Simon Necronomicon, which is another reason why I point to the Simon Necronomicon's legitimacy, because it actually bases itself off of ancient religious beliefs. So, you know, any other religion is legit, well then, you know, you could effectively work with the um, Simon Necronomicon in a, both a um, practical applications kind of way, and in a religious sense. But, getting off topic a little bit here. So, Anywho, Marduk's symbol, a symbolic animal, was Mushusu, which was the snake dragon. You can actually find a, a lot of depictions of that. I think sometimes he's depicted as uh, riding it, although his main um, mode of transportation, I guess you could say, was a was like a flying chariot, which could, you know, ancient a astronaut belief kind of stuff could mean a spaceship. But that's up for you to decide. Aliens. Anyway, so um, his weapons were... Uh, a divine wind, which was called Imhulu, um, a bow, arrows, mace, lightning, and a net that he actually used to catch Tiamat. And he can fill his body with fire, and, oh yeah, this, the chariot that he rode was described as a storm chariot. Could be because of loud noises it made, or, I don't know, yeah, you know, it's all symbolic stuff here. So, uh, a couple of his other symbols are the spade, I talked about Mushusu, and dogs and horses. So, when he rose to power in Babylon, and he overtook Enlil as, like, the big cheese in terms of what everybody was venerating, you know, whenever one deity succeeds another, they tend to adopt powers or attributes from them. So, Enlil, with his number being 50, was kind of translated into Marduk having 50 powers or 50 names. And there is, at the end of the Enuma Elish, it actually describes the different 50 names or, or that, he is, that he is given, which is basically put into the Necronomicon spellbook, probably through some um, divination and working things out by working with these deities and then given the, the sigils and stuff. So, let's see. The 50 names could be a way of him taking power from Enlil, whose number is 50, when he demanded the throne before the Zodiac Age changed. 
the zodiac determined the rulership over the earth. So let's get into that for a second. So the procession of the equinoxes, right? We're in the age of Pisces right now. It's going to go into the age of Aquarius. You notice how it moves backwards when compared to the way that we observe the, the uh, zodiac changes in terms of, you know, month to month-ish. So according to Sitchin's writings, the... Uh, the rulership over the earth was determined by the procession of the equinoxes and what age they happened to be in. Well, when Marduk was around, he was like the boss of Babylon and um, other deities were the bosses of other different regions. Like um, Ningizida had South America because he eventually fled over there and decided to hang out over there and he became known as Quetzalcoatl. Um, then you have, I think Ishtar was like the boss of Egypt at the time. And then I can't remember the other ones, but... The main idea is that Marduk was like, hey, I want to be, I want to be big cheese now. I want to be the boss. But Enlil was like, yo, it's, uh, it's, it's my time right now. So no, you can't have it. And because he was like, wait until the, the equinoxes change. Then, yeah, sure. But Marduk was like, no, but I want it right now. So he was like, I'm going to demonstrate my supremacy by building a giant spaceport. So I could have control over the skies and, you know, I can come and go as I please and everything and I could start a war. So he got all of his human followers to help him build a giant spaceport, which became known in later tales like the Old Testament as the Tower of Babel. And a fight ensued and stuff and they blew up the Tower of Babel and all that. And I think Marduk actually lost. Um, so, you know, anything that you find is like a spiritual tale tends to have a historical background. And that's what uh, Sitchin... Um, that's what Sitchin was able to figure out. I do have, like, two of Sitchin's books back there. I should buy them all. But, anyway, that's for another time. So, Marduk, in terms of his visual description, he was depicted as, like, his robes having stars on them. And, um, he was also depicted a lot of times, like, holding a, uh, a spade. You know, demonstrating that he was a god of vegetation. And, let's see. So he was not only worshipped at, at in Babylon, but also at Sippar, Borsippa, and Nippur. And um, the Jewish word Merodach, M-E-R-O-D-A-C-H, is their word for Marduk. So the, so the Jewish people did know of him, right? Um, he was referred to as Bel, which means Lord in Assyrian, B-E-L. And um, Psalm 74, lines 13 to 14, actually refer to Marduk as uh, when he slayed Tiamat, because they refer to um, somebody splitting the waters in two, you know, above and below, which is the same thing as um, what's depicted in Genesis, which is separating the waters above from the waters below. And um, let's see, what's the other thing I have? Oh, yeah, the, the big thing on the Marduk prophecy. So, way back in the day, um, when you had a temple like Marduk's ziggurat, for example, Marduk's temple in Babylon, you know, at the very center of the temple, the Holy of Holies, I guess you could call it, was the statue of the deity. And that is seen as, like, the physical manifestation of the deity, and wherever wherever that statue is, is where the god is. And when the, go when the god was in the city, you know, it meant, like, good fortune and all that stuff, and if it was to leave the city, oh, our entire world's gonna go to crap. So, the, the prophecy came about when the statue was removed from Babylon and went to another city and the prophecy was one day it will come back and Babylon will once again come to power because it was removed from the city one time when Babylon was destroyed and it was at the city the um the city state of uh, or the city of Mercilus when Babylon was sacked and that's when the prophecy came about and it actually moved to several other cities before eventually making its way back to Babylon during the reign of Nebuchadnezzar II. And as anybody that's watched um, or been in a history class knows, Nebuchadnezzar II made one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, which was the Hanging Gardens, because he rebuilt Babylon, and it was extremely powerful up until I think Xerxes, the Persian guy, came in and destroyed it, right? But Marduk returning to Babylon, his statue coming back to Babylon, um, coincided with Babylon, becoming prosperous again and then technically speaking no one has found that statue right so could it have been a statue could it have been the actual god we don't know could it have been him marduk himself we don't know but they have not recovered a statue of him that would have gone in that um 
in that temple, like the one that's described, which is very interesting. So, you know, I've gone through all of all of my notes and things here, but in terms of Marduk and uh, his influence on the Necronomicon, his he is like the patron deity of the Necronomicon, arguably along with Ishtar being the the male and female aspects of that system, which could be represented in in one way of looking at it by those two candles that you put on um, when you do the Necronomicon spellbook, right? Because there's always the duality of that um, with male and female with the two candles. But the you have the 50 names of Marduk in there. You have, um, as when you are uh, doing the gate walking, Marduk is one of the gates that you... Um, that you that you enter it's like the second to last one on just the the ones that are the um classical Keldian order of planets or the regular the regular zone I, you know and um you do get to experience his energies and work with him the enuma elish talks about his rise to power and how he is the he is the the pa the patron god um and how tiamat is totally destroyed and it does focus on the, um, you know, the dichotomy between the elder gods and the ancient ones, and basically um, Enlil, or I mean Marduk being the boss. Although it does pay a lot of homage to Enki, mainly because Enki is Marduk's father. So Marduk is a very interesting entity, and he is very interesting to work with. If you ever work with the fifty names of Marduk, or you were, or you go through the gatewalking and experience his sphere. I'm not going to get into that here because this is mainly more of a focus on the um, mythology and such, but I did want to tie it in with the Necronomicon a little bit. So let me know what you guys think about my discussion of Marduk with some of the stuff that I was able to find because a lot of the sources were very repetitive when I dug into trying to find enough information on Marduk to make a video. A, there's not a lot of source material on him because this stuff is so ancient, the writings are so ancient, there's just not that much left, which makes research about these guys a little bit difficult. But, you know, let me know what you think and drop stuff in the comments. I do have a Patreon now, by the way, which has not been added to my um, ending title thing yet because my energy is still getting back up there, and I will get to that. But my, um, so I do have a Patreon page, and I do have one Patreon right now. So, thank you, by the way. And um, so I'm going to see how many other videos that I can make during this snowstorm that we are stuck in. This video is being recorded on a Tuesday, but it will go up on a Thursday. So, you know, drop it, drop anything that you guys have to say in the comments, and you can find all of my social media links and stuff um, in the ending, the ending stuff of this video or down below in the description. Good hunting. Thanks for watching my video. So if you want to check out my playlists, I have, among others, the Simon Necronomicon, the Tree of Life, General Magic, Tulpamancy, a playlist on my books, the Elements, Stones, the Theories that Govern Magic, and the Gods and Goddesses of Mesopotamia. If you want to check out my books on Amazon, I have Creating Consciousness, Magical Mechanics, Magical Theater, Handy Sigil Magic, and The Guide to the Spheres and Beyond. You can also find me on Facebook at MagicologyYT. You can email me at priestofthenecro at gmail.com, and you can even check out my Instagram, which is Magicology. And good hunting.